Welcome to First Time for Everything, a podcast for curious people. I'm your host, Danny Elliott. I've toured the world as a backing vocalist for some of the biggest names in music, owned a prop rental business, ran a vintage boutique out of a camper I renovated, and I've had a lot of firsts in my life. I created this podcast in hopes of inspiring you to take a chance on something you've been wanting to try for the first time. We're going to discover a lot of really cool stuff together, and I'm so happy you're here. Welcome back, first timers. I'm so happy to be back with season two, and uh, we are going to kick things off with a very important episode on breast health for Breast Cancer Awareness Month. I'm talking with Melissa Shiozaki today, and she's one of the APRNs that I see personally twice a year to stay on top of my breast health due to a family history of breast cancer. And we talk about how to do a breast exam on yourself, what it's like to get one done by a professional, a bunch of things we can do to have good breast health, and also disseminating fear. One of the reasons I wanted to do this episode is because my awesome mom, Rosen Elliott, has had breast cancer twice and she is still going through her second round of it and she had no family history prior to getting her diagnosis and the reason she got her diagnosis is because she knew her body and she pushed for answers and finally got a diagnosis both times and so I think that there are some misconceptions about who should be on top of their breast health and who shouldn't when you should be aware of it. And understandably, there can be a lot of fear around breast health too. One in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer, but with early detection, breast cancer is often very treatable. I'm really inspired by my mom and how she just trusted herself and pushed for answers. And I hope that this episode inspires you today to get to know your body and trust yourself and trust your instincts and if you think that you need to go see someone even if you don't think you need to go see someone just starting a regular form of self-care in this way is so important and so helpful for you so if you've got boobs you need to hear this episode and if you know someone who has boobs you need to share it with them so we basically got everybody covered so i hope you learn a ton about your tatas today on first time examining your breasts Women's health is extremely important to me, and I think modern fertility is one of the most exciting, accessible new advancements to come out in recent years to help us really understand our bodies more. Whether you're ready to pop out a mini-me like yesterday or the thought of being someone's parent after the night you had last night seems light years away, knowledge is power. Understanding how our bodies work to better be able to prepare for the future and take better care of ourselves right now is game-changing. Modern Fertility doesn't just offer fertility testing, it also offers birth control, prenatal vitamins, ovulation and pregnancy tests, and just launched a sperm kit. Because fertility isn't just a woman's job, okay? So click the link in the show notes for $10 off your Modern Fertility hormone test and join the thousands of women who refuse to let fertility be a mystery. Now, back to the show. All right. Hi, first timers. Today we are here with uh, Melissa Shizaki, breast specialist at Cedar Sinai. Is that your official title that you go by or? Um, well, yes and no. I mean, <laughs> yes I, and I, no. I'm, I am one of the nurse practitioners there. Mm-hmm. Um, but sure, I go by breast specialist. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, uh, what made you want to get into this line of work? Breast specifically wasn't always my dream job, just to be honest. Um <laughs> I came from a, an outpatient uh, position as a nurse um, in the liver and pancreatic cancer department, so surgical oncology there. Um, and then I went back to school, became a nurse practitioner, and wanted to stay at Cedars, and then I kind of fell into the breast cancer world. <laughs> and how long have you been doing that now? I will say like, it's my sixth year now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. And how have you, how have you found it comparatively to working in like the previous field? Every job is tough. I have to say working in the breast cancer field, as strange as it sounds, is actually happier. Mm. (laughs) The amazing thing is that we have so many tools now and so much more awareness, I think, regarding breast cancer um, Mm. screening that it's caught way earlier. There's a lot of good outcomes out there. So 
in that sense, it's happier. <laughs> Amazing, which is which is why I wanted to do this episode to talk specifically about screening. Um, I had mentioned to you before we started recording that a friend of mine who's in her 40s had, hasn't had a breast exam in her entire life, which for me, as you know, my medical history, I have a family history of breast cancer, so I've been getting some type of screening since my early 30s, which is maybe on the younger side, but, sure. um, but recently, um, I was reading that the recommendation now is like 40 to start getting screenings. Mm -hmm. But when do you think women should start doing at home self exams? I mean, we encourage that starting age 18. Okay. Basically, you know, it's honestly, we know that breast cancer is very rare, mm -hmm. um, under a certain age, but I mean, starting breast awareness, just self exams, getting kind of familiar <laughs> with your yeah. breasts, starting from age 18 um, is only going to help you. <laughs> okay. And how would you recommend actually performing a self examination? So it, it's kind of tough uh, on uh, just by voice. Uh, sure. The way I teach it, it is just that familiarity you know, when you're taking a shower, a lot of people use loofahs now, so they're not actually <laughs> touching their breasts. Sure, sure. So maybe when they're done <laughs> cleaning, <Yeah. laughs> um, take an extra minute and yeah. just get familiar with your breasts. And then mm -hmm. after you're done showering, before you put any lotion on, mm -hmm. and this is once a month, mm -hmm. um, also lay down and mm -hmm. examine your breasts. Mm -hmm. And really for me, and I think for most breast specialists, it's very difficult to teach you what to look for, right? Everyone says their breasts are lumpy. They're mm -hmm. so dense. They have no clue. But I think if you're checking it once a month, you, you know what, what the differences are when you're looking in the mirror. Um, you can, you can see if, Hey, my left nipple wasn't like that last month. You know, it wasn't mm -hmm. inverted. There wasn't this little dimple there. Mm. Um, it's really just changes from what you remember from the last month. So okay. There's no, I mean, there are specifics, which we can get into. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. I would love any specifics that you, that you recommend looking for. So like inverted nipples, dimpling, right. skin, skin changes, I'm right. assuming, obviously lumps, like if you feel anything. Right. I mean, lumps are the hard one. Um, sure. When I talk to my patients, you know, bloody nipple discharge, mm. any kind of discharge is something that you should talk to your primary care doctor, your gynecologist, your breast specialist about. Mm -hmm. uh, the key point is not to panic, <laughs> I've sure. got to say. There's plenty of non-cancerous causes for those symptoms, but still get it checked out. Don't just poo-poo it and say, oh, you know, it's, it's just a little bit of uh, a breast change and that happens in my lifetime. I mean, just if you don't know, just go see your doctor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's totally. what I want to encourage. You know, we're not going to berate you for it. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. it's only going to help you and help us <laughs> make yeah. sure everyone's healthy. <laughs> totally. Totally. Yeah. Find out what's going on. I feel like knowledge is power. You'd mm -hmm. rather know. You were mentioning to do it once a month. Is there an optimal time in your cycle if you're someone who's still getting their period that you should be checking? Yeah. I mean, it's usually on day seven to 10. That's mm -hmm. basically the seventh to 10th day after you started bleeding. Okay. That, that's how we count days. Okay. Day one is the first day you actually bleed. Okay. <laughs> you know, for us, day seven to 10, that's before ovulation, mm -hmm. in case nobody knows that, but mm -hmm. um, it tends to have your lowest amount of hormones. And so hopefully that would reduce the amount of other lumpy things, quote unquote, that you're sure. feeling. Yeah. And I, I would say like in the last like few months or so started to try to make sure I do it within mm -hmm. that period of time. I've noticed that for sure. It's like the mm -hmm. least, the least lumpy time. <laughs> it's the least busy time in yes, your breasts. Yes. The least <laughs> amount of traffic is uh, <laughs> happening in there for sure. So then when should women start getting professional breast exams mm -hmm. done? Uh, definitely starting age 18. Mm -hmm. um, okay. You know, you're, you're not going to get breast imaging and, t and we can get into the whole mm -hmm. different layers of that, but definitely from age 18 on. Mm -hmm. so, and this would just yeah. be at your like gynecologist or GP. Yeah. Once a year. 
this was a first for me. I just had my annual like pap done and I have a new OBGYN out here. And she was saying, she's like, I actually don't do breast exams because it's not my specialty. Oh. And I, <laughs> and, and I, I was like, well, on one hand, I understand that because like everyone's breasts are so different and what seems off to you may mm-hmm. seem like someone else's normal or vice versa. But if that is the case and you have someone who really just specializes in like downstairs, not upstairs. Would you recommend that they find a different doctor altogether? Would you recommend they just talk to their GP about it? Or would you recommend just going straight to a breast specialist and just having someone who's like, that's what they focus on? I mean, that's a tough question. Sure. Um, these days, I think a lot of specialties are even more subspecialized. So mm. like you're saying, you know, upstairs and downstairs, a lot yeah. of gynecologists don't touch the upstairs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, just to be honest, um, as breast specialists, we, we focus on those who either have like a gene mutation that mm-hmm. causes them to be at higher risk for breast cancer, mm-hmm. personal history, those who actually have cancer and, you know, all the in between in terms of abnormal imaging and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, so getting a routine breast exam, it's a tough environment right now. Sure. I, I'm just going to be honest. Yeah. Um, so if you have a gynecologist that balks at doing that exam, I would actually change yeah. doctors. Mm-hmm. I'll be very honest. Yeah. Um, that, that's supposed to be their bread and butter. Mm-hmm. So I don't see why they would say they don't do that. <laughs> yeah. I found that interesting too, because I've liked this practice. Honestly, I'm going to them more because they're they're more focused on like fertility sure. and their focus is more on like treating pregnant women. But that was a first for me. And I, I was like, oh, that's really, I mean, and also I, I guess like I didn't mind so much because I'm always doing monthly exams and I'm also going in twice a year with the breast specialist. Sure. So, but um, I guess for someone who's not in my position, who's already kind of like on the offensive with this right yeah maybe finding a new doctor could be yeah I couldn't I would consider that Um, yeah I would consider talking to your GP Mm -hmm. your primary care doctor one of the two really should be able to do that for someone okay when you're looking for if you are if you are looking for like a breast specialist what are you looking for in particular is there is there are there certain qualities to look for or um so that's I mean, and that gets into what we were kind of hinting at earlier, you know, depending on what your situation is. Sure. Um, So if you have an issue, quote unquote, let's Mm -hmm. say you found something on a breast exam yourself Mm -hmm. and your gynecologist says, go see a breast specialist. Mm -hmm. I mean, they should be able to refer you. Mm -hmm. Um, And if they don't, I would, you know, honestly, (laughs) I'm not going to advertise where I work. (laughs) Sure, sure. But honestly, a lot of these major medical centers have high risk departments Mm -hmm. where they're basically run by less nurse practitioners. Mm -hmm. But I I would find a a medical center that has that kind of program, like a high Mm -hmm. risk program, for instance, Mm -hmm. that has a robust um, team of nurse practitioners because we, we can take on we don't just do surgery, basically. Yeah, that's super helpful to know. I think it's been like you were saying, like your doctor should be able to refer you. I just I don't know if you've felt this way about the medical kind of world as of late but I feel like and maybe I might be an extenuating circumstance because I have a lot of like different things happening in this season of life but I feel like I have had to like find every single different practitioner myself and I find it also interesting especially being in LA right now too because there's so many people with money out here that a lot of times I'll get referred to a doctor, I'll call to make an appointment and they'll be like, it's $1,500. We don't take insurance. That's just for the consultation. And you're like, well, now I have to find someone that's in network. Yes. You know, Uh, I mean, yeah. In all the metro areas, that's kind of become a thing. Yeah. And and that's what I'm saying. The unfortunate thing is a lot of the way, the way things are going, Mm. a lot of specialists, generalists are going concierge yeah um so that's why i was kind of saying like going to a major medical center yeah stanford ucsf Mm -hmm. um nyu cedar sinai ucla you know those places should take all insurances and you should not have to worry about oh will they charge me a like a retainer fee um well i have unexpected 
you know, uh, facility fees, mm -hmm. um, imaging fees. That's really helpful, I think, for people to consider when looking for a place. That way you don't have to be doing like more legwork and being like, oh, well, okay, like I can't afford that. So now I have to go find something else. Like if right. you just start there, maybe it'll be easier. Right. And I, I of course, I'm biased <laughs> but in my experience. And I'll just say, you know, it's based on my experience, you know, encountering other providers. I, I, I don't really encourage seeking out private practice breast specialists mm. at the end of the day any any everything is a business yeah <laughs> so yeah. I, I would discourage private practice for this specialty sure that's all I'm gonna say <laughs> yeah no listen like and I know this is totally just based on like your experience anyone listening will put like a caveat <laughs> sure. to, you know <laughs> sure it's just my experience and the patients yeah. that I, I take care of and yeah. what I've seen from the community and they've come to me from private practices, which they honestly, they do advertise a more like warm kind of mm -hmm. family feeling, but mm -hmm. you could still get that at a major medical center. You really can. <laughs> and ultimately, like, yes, it would be nice if someone had an amazing bedside manner, but ultimately I, I just want you to do the job. Like, <laughs> You know, like you could be an asshole to me, but if you are getting the job done, we're good. Right, like, right. And if they're gonna tell you the, you know, if they're gonna be telling you the truth, right? You don't yeah. want someone that's that's going to sugarcoat things. Yeah, so. totally, totally. And I think that's one of the things I appreciated about you as well. I I had come from a previous practitioner where they didn't sugarcoat things, but it also was a little bit of fear mongering. And I feel uh -huh. like when I came to see you, it felt like a nice balance of like, here's what we're working with. This is what we need to be aware of, but also like live your life, you right. know, and don't live in fear of this thing feeling right. like it's impending, you know? Right. I mean, that that is, again, I'm not tooting my own horn. <laughs> to, <laughs> toot it. I'm going to toot it. it. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, but it's, it's a tough topic. Yeah. No matter how you paint it, you know, whether or not you've got that family history whether or not you have that personal history of breast cancer mm. or if you know some, everyone knows somebody who's yeah. been affected by breast cancer and it's, it's the most common female cancer. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it's a really scary thing no matter yeah. who you are. So yeah, you need someone yeah. that can not sugarcoat things, but also mm -hmm. tell you how it is. <laughs> yeah, for sure. When, you know, when, you do start getting a professional breast exam or more so when you start going for screenings, what, what is that like? Like, can you tell people what kind of different types of tests you may have done? So it's a tough one if you're under 30. So, mm -hmm. you know, we can, we can, there's so many layers to it, but if we want just a general idea, sure. if you're in your thirties, you don't have any family history, you probably don't need a mammogram, but Let's say you're doing your monthly self-check, I hope, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and you find something that maybe you're not sure was there last month. Uh, so typically what we do if you're over the age of 30 is you do get a one-time mammogram on both both breasts, even mm -hmm. if what you're feeling is just one breast. Um, that's kind of like your baseline mm -hmm. um, at that point. And you typically would get a handheld diagnostic ultrasound for that particular area that you are finding something. Mammograms are a scary thing to a lot of people. Um, unfortunately, we have not come that long <laughs> a ways away from getting away from the mammogram. It is mm -hmm. the only, it's the gold standard. Mm -hmm. So we still have to panini press you. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, and I've got to tell people, yes, it's uncomfortable. It is, but it's not like you're going to be vice gripped <laughs> for hours on end. Yeah. There's different positions they have. They'll guide you. The technician mm -hmm. will guide you where to put your arm and just position uh, the, the machine around you basically. Mm -hmm. So it's not minutes on end. Yeah. It is. And you can input your experience that it's, yeah, best, but it's not for hours on end. <laughs> totally. And I haven't, I mean, I guess, you know, I'm sure everyone has different nerve like sensations sure. and, and different size breasts that they're coming in with, but you know, yeah, it's uncomfortable. I haven't found it. I think before I had my first mammogram, it was advertised as like, it's the worst thing <laughs> that you'll ever have happen to your breasts. And I'm like, I've had my dog step on my nipple. Like, <laughs> that is way more painful. Than... There's definitely a lot more painful things. <laughs> It's uncomfortable. Yeah. 
Yes. It's not – uncomfortable yes. is the only way I can describe it. Yes, for sure. <laughs> I feel like I'm going to get a lot of, like, random follow-ups to like, the dog <laughs> stepping on the nipple thing. But it's just, it's Right just, on the nipple. Yeah. It's just – when you sleep with your pet, they get into, like – they just oh. stop on weird things at times. And, yeah. That's okay. That's okay. My dog last night stepped on my throat. You know? Yeah. It's like, <laughs> And he's a 90-pound German Shepherd. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Oh, my so, God. I'm it's... glad you can talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, but... But, but, yeah, so a mammogram is a scary thing. It's it's something that typically it's once a year, once you're of age. Mm -hmm. um, but, again, we're, we're talking about, like, if you're in your 30s, for instance, yeah. and you feel something new. A lot of times at these big medical centers, I'll be honest, it's scary because the technicians kind of – they put you in the room, they tell you where to put your arm, they tell you what they're going to do, and then they kind of stick you outside again, and then they someone else brings you back yeah. for the ultrasound. Mm -hmm. And then either you're sent home or you're told to wait, wait, mm -hmm. wait, wait. So that's why I go back to saying, you know, getting a specialist, particularly an MP, is probably going to do you the best um, yeah. in terms of, like, the emotion plus mm -hmm. the expertise um, because ultimately – most breast centers will read, will look at your imaging the same day and mm -hmm. will give you the results. But that's mostly true if you have a provider, again, yeah. a nurse practitioner, for instance. But a lot of it's scary because they may do the mammogram, do the ultrasound, and then take you back for another mammogram. Mm -hmm. That's not unusual, just mm -hmm. to tell everyone out there. It doesn't mean that something is really wrong. Mm -hmm. A lot of times what we find in our 30-something-year-olds or below, um, it's typically cysts. Yeah. Um, or something like a fibroadenoma, for instance, it's a benign growth, mm -hmm. um, that we will find in our young women. Yeah. So it's not, not just because you feel a lump, does that mean you have cancer? So totally. I just put that out there. Totally. And I've, I've had that happen before too, where I had developed pretty bad health anxiety over the last three years, mm -hmm. um, just between my mom's recurrent breast cancer, my like multiple miscarriages experience. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I just got so used to hearing such negative health news. I just assumed everything I would hear would be negative and I would work myself up going into my like uh, you know, every six months, like exam. And I, I've had the whole, like, you get your mammogram, you get an ultrasound. They're like, we're going to have the doctor come in and do their own ultrasound. And then you're like <laughs> sobbing to yourself, like quietly, yeah. you know, and then you're, you know, so it's, it doesn't necessarily mean it's bad news. Like you're, what you right. were saying, it's just, I, I like, I have very dense breast. I have had cysts like come and go based on like my cycle. Um, and so, yeah, for, for anyone listening, you, you want someone to be thorough. You want someone coming in and like double checking and sure. making sure. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't mean something's yeah. wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes, honestly, if, if they do more images, it, it's because maybe the radiologist or the nurse practitioner said, you got some blurry, crappy images. Yeah. You know, maybe, yeah. They didn't get, maybe they didn't get you deep enough in the machine to get farther mm -hmm. into your breasts. So it's, yeah. not, it's not always you. <laughs> yes, totally, totally. As well, too, I know um, personally because of my family history of breast cancer, I get annual MRIs. And so is that something you would recommend to someone who's who has more of like a family history or a higher risk factor? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it really, if someone is not sure, asking your gynecologist, your primary care doctor for a referral, mm -hmm. even just for a consult, maybe you're not sure. going to be seen forever <laughs> by someone like me. Um, but, you know, at least we can give you that information, and really mm -hmm. guide you and tell you how much you should worry, <laughs> sure. for instance, right? Sure. Um, so not everyone needs a breast MRI every year. Um, yeah. I mean, the great thing, yes, MRIs are not, they don't involve radiation, mm -hmm. but they're not the gold standard. If you think about insurance covers definitely a screening mammogram every year. Mm -hmm. They definitely don't cover an MRI every year. And oh, yeah. For that. I, I, <laughs> I found that out this year with the yeah. insurance. <laughs> yes. I yeah. mean, the, the mammograms are, and, you know, I talked with a colleague about, I, actually all my colleagues about this pretty recently and pretty much more and more so lately that we're seeing, and I'm not scaring everyone out there, mm -hmm. that we're seeing a lot more young women with breast cancer yeah. in their 30s and early 40s. And whether or not that could be a function of more mammograms are being done. 
mm. at an earlier age. So sure. the more you look, the more you find. Yeah. And so that's my point is the mammogram, please don't, there's a misconception that I, I don't get mammograms because my breasts are dense. Mm. It's that's, there's more to it than that. We can get into it, but yeah. um, mammograms are that tool that can catch cancers early before mm. they even form a lump. Yeah. Microscopic disease and it can be cured. I know there's yeah. a lot more to it. I'm making it kind of simple, but definitely get your mammograms every year once you're recommended. <laughs> definitely. And I, I don't know. I know for me, like I've just kind of decided to start looking at it as like, I have to put my big girl pants on. <laughs> this is just like part of my like self care in a way and like make sh making sure that I'm like at least doing what is in my control. Like right. nothing is ever truly in our control, right? But it's <laughs> like if you can play some kind of part in in this, then going for those exams you know, like finding a practitioner you feel like you're on the same team with doing your self exams, like that's going to be your best course of action. Yeah. And I always tell people too, that it's unfortunate that sometimes your first experience with a certain provider may turn you off and yeah. scare you off. I've, I've heard that a lot where, and you, as you said earlier about fear mongering, mm. and then it sends those particular people to say, I don't want a mammogram. Ignorance is bliss basically, mm -hmm. right? I would say if you find someone like that, try to get a second opinion. Yeah. Don't be afraid to do that. Totally. I think something I've been learning and something I've been talking with, um, it's like even some of my vocal coaching clients, you know, a lot of times we'll do some troubleshooting as if they're having issues with their voice and like being like, okay, maybe you should check out this like doctor or that doctor. It's like, you do have to advocate for yourself. And if you feel like someone isn't really like hearing you or is making you feel a certain way, like always seeking out, you know, someone else who feels better. Right. And, and not everyone understands health related anxiety. And, and that is a mm. very pervasive, very common, I hate calling it an issue. There's gotta be a better word for that, but I mean, it feels it like is, an issue. It feels, issue. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, we all have anxiety mm -hmm. and I'm not minimizing it, but, mm -hmm. um, it's a thing, right? They, they mm -hmm. call it white coat hypertension, white yeah. coat high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. You go in, you're, you take your blood pressure at home and it's perfect. You go into the office, it's sky high. Yeah. So just keep going for opinions. You gotta keep yeah. trying on clothing until they, you find something that you Yeah, like. <laughs> totally, totally. It's like dating. Yeah, basically. <laughs> right, right. right. Um, you know, I, I was wondering, uh, just because a lot of stuff, because of my Hashimoto's, I am in the functional world of medicine a lot. And there's, a, you know, everybody has their opinions on stuff and their hot takes, right? And sure. I would love to know what your thoughts are on the efficacy of something like thermography, because that tends to to be touted a lot in the functional world is like you're exposed to less radiation. Mm -hmm. It's seen, like it can be potentially, um, it can detect some other things, but I've also read you can get a lot of false positives with thermography as well. So uh -huh. from a professional standpoint, I'd love to know what your take on that is. Um, are we allowed to curse on this? Yes. Oh, totally. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thermography is bullshit. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm just uh, plain and simple. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of factors to that for one, not covered by insurance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As I was going back to about private practices, everything's a business. Unfortunately, mm. the medical world has turned into a business. Yeah. So you should be wary about people who are advertising it. Um, thermography, it, it uses temperature. Mm -hmm. So the idea is they're saying, oh, there are hot spots somewhere that's warmer in the breast. There could be a cancer there. Mm. But you do read your report and there's a big disclaimer saying that it's not FDA approved to diagnose cancer. Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. That, that in itself should, should turn you off. Yes, it's not radiation, mm -hmm. but I don't know how it makes sense to anybody. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. That looking at, oh, it's really hot in this spot. Th that must be cancer there. That doesn't yeah. make any sense. If you ask any of the surgeons, any of the nurse practitioners where I work, they will all say the same expletives <laughs> about thermography. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's good to know because I, you know, I've only ever heard from like functional practitioners on this who are not breast specialists. Sure. Right. So it's really, it's enlightening to hear it, another side of it from someone who is in this every single day with this body part, you know? Yeah. I mean, and we, we've seen patients where you can actually just see the cancer, unfortunately, mm. on their skin. Yeah. And yeah. their thermography will say oh, everything was good. 
Wow. <laughs> so it's not intended again to diagnose. It's not FDA approved. Yeah. I don't know how I'm not going to use any more. No, so. no, that's <laughs> fine. You, you can. I always check that this is not suited, suitable for children <laughs> box when I distribute this. But um, another question on that tip, uh, another thing that kind of gets talked about in the functional medicine community is like the use of contrast dye in MRIs uh -huh. and uh -huh. like how that can be like potentially accumulative if you, if your body doesn't get rid of it and that can lead to other things and and also like getting regular screenings being exposed to like radiation uh -huh. maybe that's why we're finding more breast cancers because people are exposed more uh -huh. frequently so again would love your your thoughts on yeah. that yeah and then you know i'll go back to just one last thing on the thermography mm -hmm. if you have the money for it and you want to do it in supplement to mm -hmm. your usual the recommended mammograms sure. mm -hmm knock yourself out. That's not my money. Um, <laughs> yeah. but don't intend for it to replace sure. any of the proven FDA approved sure. methods. So going to your question of, or the topic about MRIs, the FDA did put out a report, I think a couple years back, um, about MRI contrast dye where they, maybe we talked about this at your appointment, initial appointment with me, um, that there was some data showing that I mean, they autopsied brains of patients who had had MRIs, uh, and they showed that there were some contrast deposits. Mm -hmm. The FDA kind of rescinded that ever since um, because it wasn't a good study. It was a one-point-in-time study. You don't know if those patients already had had brain cancer, kidney cancer, um, how old they were, how many MRIs did they have. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so in my research, and there's broader research, not just me, sure. um, it, it really boggles or boils down um, to, well, we have to weigh the risks and benefits. Let's say you're a 90 year old with a family history of breast cancer. I'm not ordering an MRI on you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, just to be honest, yes, our kidney function goes down over time. Mm -hmm. The MRI contrast dye gets filtered through your kidneys. So mm -hmm. yes, I mean, in a 90 year old, how much benefit is there for an MRI? Sure. But in a th 38 year old, for instance, mm -hmm. there's so much benefit to it. Yeah. Um, as long as you're kidneys are healthy as far as you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and you stay hydrated, it flushes mm -hmm. out through your kidneys within 24 to 48 hours. Okay. And it's a very small amount. Yeah. And then we can get even further into the science about it. Yeah. <laughs> There's a difference in the brands that are you, the contrast dye brands that are used for different body parts. Interesting. And so some structures are the molecular structures of the brands, um, are easier to break down and flush out through the kidneys, some kind of stay together. And so that has a higher chance of staying in the brain. Interesting. Um, so for breasts, at least, they use the brand that <laughs> is easy okay. to break down. So it's so interesting. I guess some part of me enjoys like researching, you know, like <laughs> looking into stuff, but like there's so many different schools of thought from so many different people. It's hard to kind of like put it all together and be like, okay, what, like, what should I be paying attention to? What should I not? What should I, you know? And ultimately I know you have to make that decision for yourself, but it's sure. helpful to hear like someone again, who's in it every day is reading like the newest research coming out and yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not just my thoughts, everybody out there, you know, it's, yeah. <laughs> collect, it's a collective hive mind yes, <laughs> yeah. of, of my breast center. Yeah. Um, but going to that topic, I think, mm -hmm. It's, if it's okay if I say this, but yeah. I think you had reached out to me about an MRI alternative to contrast. So there are some places that advertise whole body MRIs, mm -hmm. but without contrast dye. Mm -hmm. In my world, uh, the only reason and only use to using an MRI without contrast is if you have breast implants. Okay. And we want to know if the integrity of the implant is still in place, right? If you're worried okay. if there's a leak, then sure, get an MRI without contrast. But the whole point of the contrast dye is that essentially it's simulating blood flow, right? It's injected in your veins. Mm -hmm. So we want to see where there's more metabolism or higher blood flow, mm. which would indicate potentially a cancer. Sure. Because we know cancers grow by making their own blood vessel supply. Mm -hmm. So yeah. 
that's why we need the contrast for MRIs. I'm learning so much. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would also love to know, like regarding some offensive techniques in breast cancer prevention, three three different things. Your thoughts on genetic testing, like who should be getting genetic testing? I had I've had genetic testing. We've gone through that, right. um, and even though my genetic testing came all back, everything came back negative, with the exception of prostate cancer based on my family history and like different studies, I'm at like a 30 or so percent like risk for breast cancer. Who should be looking into like genetic testing if you recommend that? Yeah. So, I mean, we can expand that beyond just the breast world. If you have Ashkenazi Jewish Mm -hmm. ancestry, doesn't matter 50%, 25%. Testing might not be a bad idea. You can Mm -hmm. request it from your gynecologist, from your primary care doctor. It's your right to request it. It's more useful if there is a family history, plus you have Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry. Mm -hmm. The only reason that part matters is there tends to be a higher chance um, that you would carry one of those popular gene mutations such as BRCA Mm -hmm. or BRCA. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's why those individuals are recommended strongly to get tested. (sighs) Family history of any cancer, and I would say in a first or second degree relative, um, maybe consider testing. Mm-hmm. but it's more useful to test the person or mm-hmm. the relative that had the cancer if they're willing to get tested. Sure, yeah. I can't remember the name of the panel that I had done, but I had BRCA 1 and 2 done, but are there any other genetic tests that you recommend people get? Typically these days we don't test for just BRCA 1 and 2. Okay. Um, it, there could be, You could be tested for like 200 different genes, and there's yeah. a lot of different genes that have – multiple cancer risks Mm -hmm. um, that they're kind of related to. The main thing is, honestly, I wouldn't ask your primary care doctor or gynecologist for a blood test to get genetic testing. Mm -hmm. I would recommend having them refer you to a genetic counselor first. Mm -hmm. I don't pretend to be an expert on on genetics. Um, So I would really recommend seeing that counselor first because they can really fine tune what collection of genes that you should be tested for, if any. That was my experience too. My breast specialist had recommended me to a genetic counselor and that's how we ended up deciding like what kind of tests I should have done. And for anyone listening, I'll go back into my medical history and find what the name of that test was if anyone wants to just like kind of check it out. Second thing to check out, um, my current uh, primary doctor is a breast cancer survivor and she uh, was talking about, and I can't remember the name of it, so I'm just wondering if you happen to know, um, this kind of testing that tests um, how your body processes estrogen and kind of like moves estrogen through your body uh, um, for any estrogen driven like cancers, um, it can be sh- because I guess she was saying there are some ways that we can like preventatively start doing some things like dietarily, supplementally that help kind of help um, you process estrogen better. That I'm not familiar with. Okay. Um, I, in, in my experience, there is no, there is no hearty test for that. Um, I wish I could remember the name. Yeah. I was trying to find it earlier today. <laughs> send it to me. Send me yeah. a message later. <laughs> I'll ask her and I'll send it to you and, um, yeah, and, and I see. can let you know. <laughs> yeah, because I thought I had yeah. never heard of that either. And she was saying, she's like, I wish I had known about this before my breast cancer diagnosis because I was like estrogen dominant. And that was what was one of, one of the contributing factors to her cancer. And yeah. that That's a very, and I can talk for hours on this topic. Sure. Um, yes, most cancers are estrogen driven. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's definitely a lot of different flavors. So sure. I wouldn't say that that test is something that everyone should seek to get yeah. preemptively, right? With Without any any kind of indication to do so. Okay. Um, don't waste your money out there. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> I also, this is like a good lesson for me because I'm like, oh, I, you think I should get that? For sure. Uh, this is something hilarious that my my uh, therapist had pointed out to me. My husband constantly reminds me of is like, I I tend to like listen to strong women or like women that I respect. And I'm like, oh, you tell me I should do that? I'm going to do it. <laughs> I mean, that's fair. I mean, we you admire certain people. You respect them. I get it, yeah. right? Yeah. You trust your providers um but but definitely get more opinions that's what it boils down to yeah i'm I'm not familiar with that and you know Mm. i certainly can appreciate your doctor's personal experience but Mm. and right like you said you preface it by saying she's not a specialist so Mm, yeah um that's a vignette that's a one person kind of for sure i mean the main thing really and this may be a little off topic but 
maybe on topic a little bit, um, yeah. talking about how you could prevent cancer, what you could control yourself. Um, yeah, I would love to know what your thoughts on that. Yeah, there's a lot of myths that are going around out there like, oh, I need to switch to a natural deodorant. Mm -hmm. um, that is, oh, bullshit. I can cuss in here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Use whatever deodorant you want to. Have at it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, drinking soy milk, eating tofu, that's not going to increase your risk for breast cancer unless you are eating and drinking bucketfuls <laughs> of soy milk and okay. tofu a day. Um, the, the real main thing people can control is – Easier said than done, I know. Not smoking, mm -hmm. no tobacco, alcohol. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, again, easier said than done, but in general, it'd be great if you can't drink at all, mm -hmm. but no more than seven drinks, standard drinks a week. Mm -hmm. But that's not to say, oh, it's Saturday now, I'm going to drink all my seven drinks. Yeah, right. Now, right no binging, right. no binging. Yeah, yeah. This is kind of a segue from the estrogen dominant testing mm -hmm. that you're talking about. It's weight. Mm -hmm. So there is no glorified advertised diet for reducing breast cancer risk. It's mm -hmm. ultimately, it's the sheer body weight. I know we can argue about BMI. People sure. who are listening might kind of argue with me <laughs> about that, but it, it's obesity and overweight. And is that because that, it just, there's more to examine, there's more there to be aware of, or does it actually genetically kind of alter some things uh, or biologically? So, mm -hmm. so with, as I was saying, a lot of our breast cancers are estrogen um, positive, meaning mm -hmm. they, whatever excess estrogen you have or estrogen you just have can drive these tumors to grow. Mm -hmm. And honestly, if someone is destined, quote unquote, to get the right. cancer, yes, they will get it. Um, but taking hormone replacement therapy, for instance, after mm -hmm. menopause, high doses for a long mm -hmm. time, increase your risk for cancers growing. Um, and one of the parts of treatments that we give for patients with estrogen positive cancers is a hormone blocker. Long story short, just to be not too scientific, it, it blocks the conversion of fat to hormones. So any excess fat you have can only help this cancer grow. Interesting. That, that's what it boils down to. Wow. And plus there's other health things, right? Heart, yeah. heart health, diabetes, sure. prevention. <laughs> Um, but, but it's definitely that aspect, overweight and obesity. Yeah. Okay. Well, I feel like all of those things you listed out are all things that some of them, I should say, I know weight is like a much trickier topic for a lot of people, mm -hmm. but I think like the smoking and alcohol intake are things that are very tangible that we have some kind of control over, you know, barring like addiction issues and things like that. Of course. But, of course. That's yeah, a whole other yeah. podcast. Right. right? Yeah. No. Yeah. That's, <laughs> I, I, yeah. <laughs> but one thing I do want to put out there. IVF treatment, mm. that does not increase your risk for breast cancer. Mm. Taking birth control pills mm -hmm. does not increase your risk for breast cancer. I just want to say that because we were Is talking that, about hormones. Yeah. So, yeah. And I know you. I had asked you about that too in our visit because I had been like possibly considering IVF. Is, is that because it's like you're on it for a short period of time? and It's, it's a sh short amount of time lower doses and mm -hmm. it's not just standard estrogen and progesterone that are given to you um, mm -hmm. for IVF. There's different types of hormones. So okay. it's, that's different. So I don't want people to think that that increases their risk. I'm sure that'll be really helpful for a lot of people to, to hear. Yeah. Last thing on this section. I was uh, a couple years ago, I was reading about this MIT AI program that can, it's supposed to be able to detect like 31% of breast cancers, like five years earlier. Have you, have you read about this at all? Or like, if you have, do you have any thoughts on it? I mean, there's a lot of stuff in the works right now where they're talking mm -hmm. about AI assisted mammogram reading. They're talking mm -hmm. about these uh, molecular these blood tests, right, that can detect if you have circulating blood cell, uh, mm -hmm. cancer cells. That's still a ways away. There, okay. That's not thing, that's more, that's in research right now. It's nothing that's FDA approved. I sure. always go back to FDA approved and insurance approved. If it's not, yeah. then kind of take a step back and, and don't take it for the gospel. Okay, cool. Also good to know. Last question. So, uh, and we had started to get into this a little bit earlier, but, you know, as as we know, like this can be a scary, confronting topic for a lot of people. Do you have any mindset advice that you give people kind of starting to do breast exams or who are kind of entering into the stage of life where they need to start doing it at, at, in a more routine way to kind of just help them work through any fears they might have about going into the process? 
So, you know, of course, everyone's circumstance is different. Yeah. Um, it just, it's easy to say that what I don't know can't hurt me. But I just see too many people who are afraid to know, too afraid to look, too afraid to go for the mammogram. They just don't want bad news. Mm. But I see so much regret um, in that instance where so many cancers, not every cancer of the breast needs chemotherapy. Mm. Sometimes yes. it's limited to surgery. Mm -hmm. And I just think that cancer is a scary thing no matter what. Um, but think about how much, I just think how much worse it could be if you take that mindset of, I don't want to know. Yeah. So finding something early. That, that's why in, me in the medical field, right, in all our training, it's all about prevention. Mm. It's all about checking. More checking is okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your uh, sharing your experience and your expertise on this super important topic. Everybody start getting to know your ladies. Okay. Get your Feel hands. Them up. Feel, Feel them up. up. Feel yourself <laughs> up. Put, you know, light some candles, put some music <laughs> on, like make it a nice experience. Um, have, have your partner check you yeah. too. Have at it. <laughs> you know, legitimately. Like, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. I mean, it's not to keep your thing going, but I mean, there's a plenty of partners who have found yeah. Breast cancers of my patients. So, yeah. So free the boobies. Totally. <laughs> check them out. Just check you them want... out. Be comfortable. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you so much to Melissa for sharing her expertise and insight with us on breast health. I hope everybody goes home today and gets acquainted with yourselves, if you know what I mean. Uh, you know, make it a good time and have your partner get to know what's going on up top. Because like Melissa said, she has had times when partners are the ones that discovered something felt different in their partner's breast. So listen, the more we all know what's going on with our boobs and are familiar with what things uh, typically feel like the better. So most insurance will cover a yearly mammogram, but if you don't meet your insurance criteria, whether that's because you are too young or uh, there's no family history, the CDC, Susan G. Komen Foundation, and other local breast cancer awareness events will usually offer free screenings. We do so much for our friends, our family, our communities, and it can be really easy to get caught up in life, but we deserve to take care of ourselves, and this is a really great way to take care of ourselves. So if you're not getting screened already, there are various ways that you can start doing that that are accessible. If you enjoyed today's show, please subscribe to the show so you can stay updated on new episodes, and also please share it with a friend or a few. And if you want to stay in touch with me, you can do that over on Instagram at Danny Official, and that's at D-A-A-N-I Official, or over on TikTok at F-T-F-E Pod. First Time for Everything is produced by Two Sheila's Productions, and our theme song is Closer, sung by me, written by me, and the Royal Foundry, and produced by the Royal Foundry. Thank you so much for being with me today, and remember, it is never too late for your first time.